Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's of edition of Holotube. We are very happy to have um, Alexandre Serantes from Barcelona with us today, and he's going to tell us about, as you can read, relativistic hydrodynamics from a single end perspective. So, Alexandre, the floor is yours, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Matthias. So let me start by thanking the audience for being here and giving my special thanks to the Holotube team for inviting me to speak. I'm delighted to be here, and it's such a it's it's a wonderful opportunity to be to do so. So let's see. So uh, in this talk, I will be telling you about work done in collaboration with Michal Heller, Michal Spalinski, Victor Svensson, and Ben Withers, that appear uh, by the end of 2021 in archive. And this work uh, resulted in two papers that I will try to describe in the first and in the second part of the talk. So as you can see from the title, the talk is going to be about relativistic hydrodynamics. So as we all know, relativistic hydrodynamics is an effective theory which describes for us the infrared behavior of any relativistic medium and though with conserved quantities. And this effective theory description of the late time and long range dynamics of relativistic media with conserved quantities in, is based on a key organizational principle, which is a gradient expansion around local thermal equilibrium. So this is a perturbative scheme with an infinite number of terms organized by the number of space-time gradients in which the first one corresponds to ideal fluid flows and the higher order ones encode dissipative behavior. Now, uh, due to its uh, wide scope, relativistic hydrodynamics is of wide applicability in physics, and in particular, it is a pivotal tool to model real-world non-equilibrium phenomena, including the quark gluon plasma forming high-energy nuclear collisions, but also diverse astrophysical phenomena such as neutron star mergers. And I think it's uh, a first statement is that despite being an old subject, there are still plenty of open problems to explore in the topic of relativistic hydrodynamics. Uh, in this talk, we are going to focus on a very concrete aspect of relativistic hydrodynamics, which is the nature of the grand expansion itself. So after a slight motivation uh, coming from holography as of why you should be interested in this question, I'm going to start reviewing what is known about it. And I think that it's fair to say that uh, until, and at least to the best of my knowledge, until the work that we put in archive by the end of last year, our understanding of the gradient expansion of relativistic hydrodynamics was restricted to limiting scenarios. The first one pertained to general fluid flows in the linear response theory regime, and the second one pertained to nonlinear fluid flows of commoving nature. So I said that I'm going to give you a motivational slide uh, coming from ADSCFT. So here it is. So why would you be interested in the nature of the gradient expansion of relativistic hydrodynamics? So one of the most uh, universal lessons from the first principle studies of holographic plasmas out of equilibrium is that the gradient expansion uh, when truncated to low order can work successfully even away from local equilibrium. This observation is oftentimes summarized by the slogan that the hydrodynamization time, which is the time for relativistic hydrodynamics when truncated to first or second order to be applicable is different from the local equilibration time, which is the time for uh, dissipative corrections to the ideal flow behavior to become small. So here in this plot, you can see a trademark example of the difference between hydrodynamization time and local equilibration time. So here you see uh, the time evolution of the dimensionless pressure and isotropy as computed in Bjorken flow in ADS-CFT. And you see that this quantity is well described by relativistic hydrodynamics, even in the regime in which it's order one. And of course, if you are faced with this uh, observation uh, and then you, it's natural for you to ask yourself the question of what is the mechanism determining the applicability regime of relativistic hydrodynamics. And as in any other perturbative scheme in physics, to know where this perturbative scheme is applicable, we have to understand what the asymptotic properties of the approximations that the scheme um, provides us uh, are. Okay, so this is the motivation from ADSCFT for looking into this problem. So now, as I said, uh, we have a comprehensive understanding of this question in two limiting regimes. So let me start by uh, discussing the first, which is the linear response theory regime. Okay, so a notion that's going to be central for our discussion of the gradient expansion of relativistic hydrodynamics in the linear response theory regime is that of a mode, which we are going to be defining as a singularity of the retarded thermal two-point function of the conserved current we are interested in. And as we all know, modes come in two different classes, 
So the first class are heterodynamic modes defined by the property that their frequency vanishes as the spatial three momentum does. And these modes, as you can see from this uh, expression here, represent long-lived and slowly varying perturbations of the thermal equilibrium state. Any mode not falling into this class is called a non-hydrodynamic mode, and it's defined by the property that it's finite as the three momentum vanishes. So these modes here generally represent transient perturbations of the thermal equilibrium state. Now, hydrodynamics being an effective theory description of the dynamics of these long-lived and slowly varying perturbations would only tell you what the small momentum expansion of the hydrodynamic mode frequency are. And the question that you may ask yourself is, is this a small momentum expansion convergent or not? Now, uh, starting with the original work by Ben in 2018 on this subject and the subsequent work of Rosdanov, Kovtu, and Stadiness and Tadic uh, the next year, this question has been under intense scrutiny by the ads safety community. And I think that it's fair to say that the common observation of these studies is that this small momentum expansion has a finite radius of convergence. So what is the mechanism setting this radius of convergence? So uh, in my opinion, the overarching picture that emerged from these ads cft studies, and which also applies to theories of the mu layers to toward kind and kinetic theory in the relaxation time approximation, as we discussed in this work here, based on previous work by Romanski, is the following. So the hydrodynamic mode frequencies have branch point singularities in the complex momentum plane, the radius of convergence of this small momentum expansion of the hydrodynamic mode frequency is set by the branch point singularity, which is closest to the origin. And this branch point singularity always appears at a complex momenta, momentum for which the hydrodynamic mode frequency collides with a non-hydrodynamic singularity of the retarded thermal two-point function. So the take-home message from these results that I want you to keep in mind is that they show that the large order behavior of relativistic hydrodynamics and non-hydrodynamic modes are deeply intertwined. And in fact, if you adopt the useful perspective of thinking of the hydrodynamic and the non-hydrodynamic modes as different sheets of a unique Riemann surface, it's even possible to employ analytic continuation techniques to reconstruct the transient modes even from the hydrodynamic data alone. But this intertwinement goes as deep as, being, as allowing you to do this. Okay, so um, these results were for a small momentum expansion of the hydrodynamic mode frequencies, and it's natural to ask what is their counterpart in position space. So um, we addressed this question uh, in 2020, and we demonstrated that the finite convergence radius of the small momentum expansion of the hydrodynamic mode frequencies actually implies the factorial divergence of the position space gradient expansion for generic fluid flows. And in particular, we also show that if the momentum space support of the flow is capped, if the flow has a finite support of momentum space, then the factorial divergence of the position space gradient expansion would go away and would give way to a geometric growth. And if you want to know more about how these results are obtained, I would uh, tell you to see Ben's collective talk in 2020 for a detailed discussion of this work. Okay, so I think that in my opinion, this subsumes uh, our knowledge of gradient expansions in the linear response regime, but we also have a complementary set of studies that uh, approach this question at the fully nonlinear level. Now, these studies, uh, to the best of my knowledge, have been restricted to a particular class of nonlinear fluid flows of commoving nature, uh, which include Gapser flow and particularly Bjorken flow. So, what is Bjorken flow? So, in Bjorken flow, uh, which is the example I'm going to be focusing on, you essentially, so this is a flow uh, taking place in Minkowski space in which you basically single out uh, a spatial direction, X, and you postulate that the flow dynamics are translationally invariant and rotationally invariant in the directions transverse to X, while in the longitudinal plane spanned by X and T, you make the additional assumption that the flow dynamics are boost invariant. So they only depend on the proper time defined in this way in terms of T and X. Now, uh, under these symmetry assumptions, it turns out that your energy momentum tensor takes a diagonal form. And if you are considering a conformal field theory placed in Minkowski space in such a way that this subject is stressless, the only dynamical degree of freedom you have to care about is the energy density, which would fix for you the longitudinal and the transverse pressure. Now, in the context of Bjorken flow, relativistic hydrodynamics would predict for you the form of the energy density in a near equilibrium large proper time expansion, which takes this form with characteristic fractional powers of one over tau. And the question you may ask yourself 
in the context of this talk is whether this gradient expansion is a convergent series. So now this question was originally addressed in 2013 by Michael Heller, uh, Romuald Janik, and Witashik. Uh, they employed ads cft techniques to compute the large order behavior of this gradient expansion in A equals for Susie and Miss in the top limit. And the result that they found was that this gradient expansion is factorially divergent. So you can, how can you quantify this? Well, you can compute the root test as applied to the gradient expansion coefficients and find that at, at asymptotically large chain, it grows linearly with time. So here you have a plot representing this situation. But not only that, this gradient expansion also provides an additional example of the general lesson I mentioned before. Why? Because the large order behavior of this hydrodynamic gradient expansion is again deeply intertwined with a non-hydrodynamic transient sector. So you can see this by taking your originally factorially divergent gradient expansion for the energy density but really transforming it in such a way that you're constructing a series expansion with a finite convergence radius, and then finding out that the convergence radius of this uh, Borel transform is set by the lowest non hydrodynamic mode evaluated at zero momentum. So here you have an example of how this uh, singularity looks in the Borel plane. Okay. And in my opinion, by now we have an almost universal picture. Um, for the gradient expansion in co-moving flows that applies to ADCFT, but also to Muller's rule to our life theories and kinetic theory. So we know that in these situations for co-moving flows, uh, the gradient expansion is a factorially divergent asymptotic series, and its large sort of factorial growth is governed by non-hydrodynamic degrees of freedom. And it turns out, given these two observations, that the natural language to describe this phenomenology is that of trans series and resurgent analysis. So you have to think of your originally factorially divergent hydrodynamic gradient expansion as nothing but the perturbative series sector of a full trans-series representation of your energy momentum tensor in which the non-perturbative uh, trans-series sectors are supplemented with exponentially decaying contributions determined by the non-hydrodynamic uh, quasi-normal modes. And this line of reasoning is one of the ways in which you can get to the notion of hydrodynamic attractor, which was originally introduced by Michal and Michal, and later on developed by Ramatsky and others, including people in the first list of authors. But of course, the knowledge that we have um, to, uh, to this point is partial. So what we need to do to increase our understanding of the gradient expansion of relativistic hydrodynamics is to bridge the gap between the studies of generic fluid flows in the linear response regime and the studies of nonlinear moving flows. And this is going to demand from us developing novel computational techniques and novel conceptual insights. So what I want to do in this talk is to report on novel progress in this direction. So for the first part, I'm going to be presenting the first explicit computations of the gradient expansion at the fully nonlinear level beyond the realm of moving flows. And in the second part of the talk, I will discuss a new perspective into the larger behavior of the gradient expansion for general fluid flows based on the idea or in the notion of singulars. Okay. And just to be completely clear about the particular question we will be addressing in this talk, uh, I want to emphasize that we are going to be working in, in the Landau frame. So we are going to take our energy momentum tensor and decomposing it into an ideal piece parameterized in terms of the energy density and the fluid velocity defined as the solutions of this eigenvalue problem here and a dissipative piece. Now we are also be going to work uh, exclusively with conformal field theories placed in Minkowski space in such a way that our energy momentum tensor is going to be traceless, implying that the dissipative tensor is going to be traceless and that the pressure is going to be related to the energy density through the, through the standard equation of state for a conformal fluid. And for us, classical hydrodynamics as an effective field theory is going to be defined by the constitutive relations, which are going to express the dissipative tensor as an infinite series in gradients of our hydrodynamic fields, which are the energy density, and the fluid velocity. And the operational question we are going to be trying to answer is what is the large sort of behavior of this gradient expanded constitutive relations when evaluated on a particular fluid flow? And please keep in mind that this is the operational question that ADS-CFT studies of the applicability of relativistic hydrodynamics uh, typically address, okay? So this would finish the introductory part of the talk. And I would like to ask you if you have any questions uh, up to this point. Okay, let me see.
no questions here, so I hope this was crystal clear for everybody. So now let me start then describing our newest results on this subject. So uh, in the first part of the talk, properly speaking, what I'm going to be describing is a new computational technique to obtain the gradient expansion at the fully nonlinear level beyond the realm of moving flows. Now, this computational method is going to be applicable in any theory of the mu layer squares to our kind. If you don't know what this is, don't worry, I will define it later on for you. And while the method is going to be valid for generic fluid flows, uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on a particular kind of nonlinear fluid flow, which are longitudinal flows. So what is a longitudinal flow? So we're going to define a longitudinal flow as a flow that shares the symmetry restrictions of Bjork and flow with the exception of being boost invariant in the longitudinal plane. So our fluid flow is going to be characterized by an energy density, which is going to depend on the longitudinal plane coordinates, T and X, a uninormalized fluid velocity, which due to our symmetry assumptions is going to be parameterized in terms of a single degree of freedom, small u, and a dissipative tensor, which again, due, due to our symmetry assumptions, is going to be parameterized by a single degree of freedom, pi star. So please keep in mind that the energy density, u and pi star, are going to be completely generic functions of the longitudinal plane coordinates t and x. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I will be, since we are working with conformal fluids, I will be trading the energy density for an effective uh, out of equilibrium temperature, which is defined through the energy density by means of the equilibrium equation of state. And if you want to have a physical picture in mind, you can think of longitudinal fluid flows as a nonlinear sound wave, okay? So the toy model we are going to be working with is BRS3 theory. So what is BRS3 theory? Well, BRS3 theory is a causal ultraviolet completion of second order relativistic hydrodynamics. And the perspective we are going to be taking here is to think of BRS3 theory as a fully fledged microscopic theory. Now, this perspective is justified by two facts. The first fact is that BRS3 theory, in addition to non-hydrodynamic modes, contains non-hydrodynamical ones. Second fact, the gradient expansion of BRS3 theory, like in any other microscopic theory, features an infinite number of terms, okay? So how do you construct BRS3 theory? Well, you take your energy momentum tensor, you decompose it again into an ideal and a dissipative part. And apart from the, the conservation equation of the full object, you now postulate that your dissipative tensor is promoted to a set of independent dynamical degrees of freedom subject to the wrong equation of motion. So the equation of motion takes this form schematically. So here you see a bicovariant longitudinal derivative around the fluid flow, a relaxation time, the shear viscosity, and the shear tensor. So the shear tensor, just to remind you very briefly, is the symmetric transverse and trace part of the velocity gradient. And in a conformal field theory or in a conformal fluid, the relaxation time and the shear viscosity are fixed in terms of the local temperature through dimensional analysis. So now, uh, given this model, how are we going to compute the gradient expansion? So our approach to doing this computation is the following. We are going to introduce a fictitious bookkeeping parameter, epsilon, which is going to count for us the number of space-time gradients in a given expression through this homogeneous rescaling of the longitudinal plane coordinates. And together with this uh, homogeneous rescaling of the longitudinal plane coordinates, we are going to put forward a um, formal power series ansatz for pi star. So this is going to be our hydrodynamic gradient expansion here. Now, if you perform this rescaling in the equation of motion over by star in BRS3 theory, and you plug in these assets and solve order by order in an expansion around epsilon equals zero, you find a series of recursion relations for the gradient expansion coefficients by star n. So the strategy we are going to take in order to evaluate the gradient expansion is numerical in nature and consists of the following steps. So first, we are going to choose initial data in BRS3 theory. This uh, amounts to specifying a temperature profile, a fluid velocity profile, and a pi star profile. Then we are going to solve the equations of motion of BRS3 theory numerically. And finally, given this numerical solution, we are going to employ the recursion relations given the gradient expansion coefficients to evaluate the gradient expansion numerically. And the end result that we found following this procedure was that irrespectively of initial data, irrespectively of values of relaxation time or shear viscosity, and irrespectively of the space-time point being considered, the gradient expansion for longitudinal flows at the fully nonlinear level is a factorially divergent asymptotic series. So here you can see an example of this statement I just made. Uh, on the left plot, you have the density profile of the temperature 
in a given longitudinal flow. So the lines correspond to flow lines, and we have selected three points. So in each one of these three points, we follow the procedure just described to compute the gradient expansion, and the only result that we find, as quantified in the right plot, is that this gradient expansion is factorially divergent. And you can see this very clearly from the fact that the root test, as applied to the gradient expansion coefficients, grows linearly with the order. OK? So this is a direct generalization of the observations made previously for commoving flows uplifting the symmetry restriction of host environment. Now, in practice, we have access to our fluid flow on a space-time lattice, and we have to view the recursion relations as a matrix operation in which we take the dissipative tensor evaluated on this lattice, we apply a given matrix operator, and we obtain, we obtain the next uh, coefficient of the gradient expansion. When it comes to convergence, I want to emphasize two facts. The first fact is that if you fix the lattice spacing and you go to asymptotically large order, you would see that due to the finiteness of the space time lattice, you're not going to get a factorial divergence, but just geometric growth controlled by the largest eigenvalue of this matrix M. And in taking the continuum limit, what you have to do is to place yourself at a fixed order and then take the lattice spacing to zero. So if you do this, you're going to see that the largest eigenvalue of this matrix uh, control in the recursion relations is going to diverge, and then you're going to recover the factorial growth. So here you have an example of convergence of this procedure in this plot. And I want to emphasize that this observation provides a nonlinear counterpart of the previous fact that I mentioned about the gradient expansion being geometrically growing when you cap off the momentum space support of your initial data in the, in the linear response theory region. And if you remember what I said before, I didn't emphasize this very much, but if we come here, I said that we had an almost universal picture for commoving flows in general theories. And the reason behind the almost is that in 2019, the Nicola Noronha found the only non counter example to the general fact that the gradient expansion in Yorkian flow is factorially divergent series. So we revisit their model. Uh, utilizing our newly developed uh, computational techniques. And what we found is that their observation was restricted to Bjork and flow. If you break boosting variance in the longitudinal plane in the slightest, you recover a factorially divergent behavior. And here you can see an example of that. We see that the Bjork and flow degradient expansion coefficients uh, grow geometrically, represented by the saturation of the root test applied to them to a finite value. But if we slightly break boost invariance, we see that after a regime in which we essentially get the same behavior, uh, the series starts to diverge factorially again. And we managed to explain uh, the original halt of the factorial growth in the Nenico Noronha model through the observation that in their model, the first coefficient of the gradient expansion is actually a linear combination of agent functions of the operator which implements the recursion relations. So this explain, right, explains right away why in this example, in concrete, you cannot fi find factorial growth. And as take home points of this first part of the talk, I would like you to keep in mind, essentially, that the nonlinear longitudinal flow results that we have found conform to the expectations of our, linear, our previous linear response theory analysis. So in particular, uh, we found that the factorial growth of the gradient expansion does not seem to rely essentially on having a number of transport coefficients at each order of the gradient expansion, which grows factorially with the order. We have checked explicitly that for the gradient expansion of BS3 theory that we have been working with, this number of independent structures contributing at a given order only grows geometrically with the order, and still you get factorial growth. And second, uh, it, it seems so you know, the factorial growth of the gradient expansion does really seem to need that the system is able to support excitations of arbitrarily short wavelength. We have seen that in linear response theory, the factorial growth is going to be killed by introducing a finite. Uh, momentum space support by capping the support of the fluid in momentum space. And here at the fully nonlinear level, we have seen that the factorial growth is killed if we work with a finite space time lattice. And also, as the, the Nicole Noronha example shows, imposing special symmetries, for instance, boost invariant, invariants, might also hold the factorial growth in several situations. OK, so with this, I conclude the first part of the talk. And I want to know if you have any questions or comments. Uh, let's see.
no questions or no comments? Okay, so good. Okay, so now I'm going to enter into the final part of the talk, which is the one in which I'm going to be discussing singulars. So if you remember, okay, sorry, this is not, uh -huh, okay. So if you remember in this example here, uh, sorry, Jesus Christ, here, uh, okay, here. So here we've seen that the slope of the root test plot changed from a space-time point to a space-time point. So this slope is a space-time dependent quantity. So what we are going to do now is to postulate that this slope is going to be governed by an emerging collective field we are going to be referring to as the singulant. Now, the notion of singulant was introduced by Dingle in the 70s in his classical treaty on asymptotic analysis. And here we are going to make extensive use of this notion. So what is a singulant? Well, we are going to postulate that the large, that the asymptotically in large n, the nth gradient expansion coefficient by star n takes the following form given by a factorial over power ansatz. So you have a featureless large sort of factorial growth, which is supplemented by a subleading geometrically growing correction encoded in the singular field, which is space independent. So you see here extra fields A and gamma, but don't worry about them because they are going to play no role in our upcoming analysis because we are always going to be working at leading order in, large, in N at large. Now, if you postulate this asymptotic form, you see right away that the root test as applied to the gradient expansion coefficients uh, is linear in N and has a slope, which is determined right away by the norm of the singular field. Now, in the remaining part of the talk, I'm going to be discussing the um, usefulness of singular of singulants extensively. So I want to convey three main points. The first one is that singulants obey simple equations of motion. The second one is that singulants are going to embody a duality between far from equilibrium or relativistic heterodynamics and linear response around global equilibrium through their equations of motion. And finally, I'm going to show explicit examples in which singulants provide a proxy for the optimal truncation order and the optimal truncation error of the gradient expansion. Now, uh, to obtain the singular equation of motion, we can follow two independent but complementary approaches which give equivalent results. So the first approach is to work at the level of the recursion relations for the gradient expansion coefficients and realizing that for any function with this asymptotic behavior, at asymptotically large order, you have an effective linearization, linearization and aconalization. The second approach is what I'm going to be calling the trend series approach. And it relies on the assumption that singulants well, in the, on the assumption that if you consider the fully fleshed trans series representation of the quantity you're interested in, singulants are going to appear as non actions weighting the non perturbative trans series sectors, which supplement the perturbative trans series sector corresponding to the gradient expansion. Now, in this approach, you would, if you follow this approach, you would obtain results which are exactly equivalent to the ones coming from the first approach. And with this insight, you can think of the singular equation of motion as a WKB econal equation. Okay. Now, an important consequence of this linearization that I want to emphasize is that the most generic asymptotic behavior for a factorially divergent series that you can get is not quite of this form, but given by a linear combination of terms of this form. Okay. So you're going to have multiple singulars. So the singulars are either going to be real or come in complex conjugated place, play, uh, pairs due to the reality of the gradient expansion. OK, so if you follow either approach 1 or approach 2 to the computation of the singular dynamics in BRS3 theory, you're going to find that singulars are constrained to obey this equation of motion here, which you can determine analytically. So at a given space-time point, at a given point in the longitudinal plane, the longitudinal derivative of the singulant, meaning the derivative of the singulant along the fluid velocity, is going to be governed by the inverse of the relaxation time evaluated at the local temperature. It's simple to solve this equation if you integrate it along a flow line. And what you find is that singulars are such that their imaginary part along a flow line stays constant while the real part grows. So as the system flows to thermal equilibrium and you follow a particular flow line, what you're going to see is an increase in the real part of the singulars, which is going to be correlated with the decrease of this, you know, the progressive suppression of this number derivative trans series contribution. Now, uh, how do we cross check that this singular equation of motion we have predicted analytically is actually realized in practice? Well, we am, are going to employ our numerical computation of the gradient expansion, which you can see here. We are going to correlate transform it 
to go from the series with zero radius of convergence to a series with a finite radius of convergence. And finally, we are going to analytically continue this series and look for its branch point singularities in the complex plane. Now, the singularities are going to be identified with these branch point singularities. And please keep in mind that in practice, since we only have access to a very large but finite number of coefficients of the gradient expansion, this analytic continuation is going to be implemented through Padea approximants. And hence, instead of seeing branch points and associated branch cuts, what we are going to be seeing are lines of pole condensation, which corresponds to discretized branch cuts. Okay? So here you have an example in which we focus on a particular space time point. We compute the gradient expansion. We analytically continue it. So we compute its Borel transform. We analytically continue it through by the approximants. And we look at the singularities of these by the approximants. And what you see are four lines of pole condensations emanating from four different points, which come in complex conjugated pairs. So each one of these points is a candidate singular. And if we now move along a particular fluid flow line passing through this point, and we track the movement of singulants, we find the numerical results show in this rightmost plot. And you see that in black, the singulants are going to describe this particular trajectory. And you can show that this trajectory matches our analytic prediction for the singulant dynamics. So in BRS3 theory, singulants exist and are and obey dynamics, which are determined analytically through this equation here. OK? And as you've seen in this example as well, at every space time point, we have several singulants. And of course, we can order them through their absolute value. So I'm going to be denoting the singulant with the smallest absolute value at a given space time point as the dominant singulant. And it turns out that you can show explicitly that the dominant singulant provides a reliable, reliable estimate of the order of optimal truncation of the gradient expansion. So this estimate consists in just computing the norm of the dominant singulant and taking its integer part. So here you see uh, the plot of the gradient expansion. This is just a log plot. It's not a root test plot at three different uh, points along the same flow line. And you see that at each point, the gradient expansion coefficients have a common trend. They first decrease, reach a value region, and then start increasing again. Now, the order selected by this estimate is precisely as you would expect if you have ever worked with a factor A divergent asymptotic series in the value region. And in fact, if you compare the order of optimal truncation of the gradient expansion as you move along this flow line, and you compare the error that this order of optimal truncation is incurring with the order of our estimate, you would see that both quantities, here in black dots, you see the true uh, error of the optimal truncation. Here in the red dots, you see the truncation error of our estimate of the order of optimal truncation. So you see that both quantities decrease exponentially in time and have the same uh, time dependence. So for comparison here, I'm also plotting the results of first and second order viscous hydrodynamics, which you see that does a worse job than the optimal truncation, uh, the, the optimal truncation of the gradient expansion, which is correctly described by singulants. So this shows that singulants are actually governing the optimal truncation of the gradient expansion in BRS theory. So this is another uh, usefulness of them that we have just um, found out. Okay, and as I said before, uh, in the point two that I wanted to emphasize, the singular, as I mentioned that the singular equation of motion was dual to a particular linear response theory problem. And now I want to tell you what this linear response theory problem is. So it turns out that if you want to find the singular equation of motion, rather than solving uh, asymptotically the recursion relations, you can follow an alternative approach. So in this alternative approach, you consider the equation of motion for five star in BRS3 theory, and you ask what is the dispersion relation of infinitesimal plane wave perturbations of pi star with the temperature and the fluid velocity set to a space-time independent constants. Now, if you find the dispersion relation for this uh, plane wave perturbations, the map in which you send the global temperature to the local temperature, the global fluid velocity to the local fluid velocity, and the four vector to the singular gradient gives you right away the singular equation of motion. So in this sense, the singular equation of motion is dual to a particular res linear response theory problem. And a point that I want you to keep in mind is that this linear response theory problem might or may not be equivalent to a computation of the sound channel modes in your system. So if we consider the case of BRS3 theory, this is the 
linear response theory um, relate the dispersion relation which under the map is dual to the single equation of motion and we can compare it with the dispersion relation of the sound channel modes which you can see here and you see that both this linear response theory well this dispersion relation and this dispersion relation only agree at zero momentum so at zero momentum you have a single non-hydrodynamic mode in brs3 theory which well a single sound channel non-hydrodynamic mode in brs3 theory which takes this value and you see that this value solves right away the linear response theory problem which is dual to the single equation of motion under the map so this shows that for any longitudinal flow in brs3 theory singularants are going to be ruled by the non-hydrodynamic sound mode of brs3 theory evaluated at zero momentum and at the local temperature of the fluid flow and also the movement of the singular field that we have this you know, we have seen that as we move along a flow line the singular field is going to have an increase in real part and we can think of this increase in real part which corresponds to a movement of the singular towards the right in the right plane as the far from equilibrium counterpart of the decay of the non-hydrodynamic fluctuations around thermal equilibrium okay so uh, i would like to stop here and ask if somebody has any question Uh, uh, uh okay let me say no questions okay okay good so um okay so we have seen that in brs3 theory the single equation of motion is going to be governed by the non-hydrodynamic sound modes evaluated at zero momentum. And it's natural to wonder whether this is a particular feature of BRC theory or a generic property of mueller stewart like theories. So I want to emphasize that the reason why in BRC theory, the singular dynamics were determined right away by the non-hydrodynamic sound modes evaluated at zero momentum was that the equation of motion for five union in BRC theory only contained longitudinal derivatives along the fluid flow. But this is not a generic property of any MIS-like model you want to consider, and it, as I will argue later on, is not a property that we expect to hold in ADSFT. So to construct a toy model which features the most general possible behavior for the single and dynamics, we took a model introduced previously by Michal, Janik, Spanisky, and Witashik in 2014, and upgraded it. So the HSW model, as originally introduced, was an upgrade of a BRS3 theory, which aimed at incorporating a non-hydrodynamic sector closer to the ADS51. And this was achieved by promoting the first order differential operator acting on mu nu in BRS3 theory to a second order one. Now, originally, this second order differential operator only involved longitudinal derivatives, and here we are supplementing it with a new term which involves transverse derivatives along the fluid flow. Now, we have shown that this model, at least at the level of linearized perturbations around thermal equilibrium, is causal and stable in all channels, uh, shear, sound, and tensor. And I want to raise a question for you of whether you think that this model can have any phenomenological utility uh, when it comes to hydrodynamic modeling of um, real world phenomena. Now, in this model, we can adopt the techniques that I've discussed before to find what the singular equation of motion is. And crucially, as you see here, apart from longitudinal derivatives of the singular field along the fluid flow, it also features transverse one. So here, set of chi is the action of this vector field set which is uninormalized and orthogonal to the fluid velocity on the singular. Now, the associated linear response theory problem to this singular equation of motion is this one here. And if you compare this problem with the one giving you the sound channel dispersion relation, which you see here, you see that they are only going to be equivalent provided that this uh, three momentum Q vanishes. But under the map between this problem and the singular equation of motion, Q vanishing implies that sets, set vanishes and this is not a generic property. This is an additional symmetry restriction that you have to impose on your longitudinal flow. So generically in this model, the singular dynamics is not going to be governed by the non-hydrodynamic sound modes evaluated at zero momentum, unless set of chi, which is a statement that the transverse derivative of chi along the flow is, vanishes, which is vanishing, which is precisely the symmetry restriction that Bjork and flow obeys. So in Bjork and flow in this model, the single dynamics are going to be governed by the non-hydrodynamic sound modes at zero momentum, but for any other longitudinal flow, this is not going to be the case. And as I will argue soon enough in the talk, this is going to be a property shared by the ADSFT. Okay. 
Now, uh, of course, we have employed our standard numerical techniques to demonstrate that the gradient expansion in this generalized HSW model is factorially divergent. And we have also checked that singulants obey the equation of motion we have created analytically. So here you can see a check of the singulant equation of motion. Uh, the dots correspond to the terms involved in singulant derivatives, and the red line corresponds to the part which depends only on the local temperature of the fluid flow. And you see that both quantities track each other beautifully. And in particular, note that in these dots, the term involving transverse derivatives of the singulant, transverse derivatives of the singulant, is of the same order of magnitude as the, as the ones involving longitudinal derivatives. Now, um, since we have, as we have seen, the singulant equation of motion is equivalent under a particular map to a particular linear response theory problem. And it's natural to wonder whether this linear response theory problem that keeps the singular dynamics under this map has an independent definition. So I want to remind you, and in particular, if you were here last week for GG in stock, you would remember this, that in any four-dimensional conformal fluid, the sum channel modes are constrained to obey this relationship here, where this gamma s that you see here is a momentum-dependent sound attenuation length and corresponds to a microscopic theory observable, which is defined by this relationship between the linearized perturbation of the dissipative tensor and the linearized perturbation of the velocity field in the sound channel. So gamma s is the proportionality factor between these two quantities in Fourier space. Uh, in Gigi stock, gamma s was called nu, for those of you who remember, and it was only dependent on the frequency, not on the free momentum, because of the particular phenomenological model he was working with. Now, it turns out that you can compute gamma s in closed form in both BR3 theory and the generalized HSW model. This quantity is going to feature pores in the lower half complex frequency plane. And these pores are precisely, computing these pores is precisely the linear response theory problem that gives the singular integration of motion. So in all the MIS like models we have considered, the singular dynamics are fixed by the pores of gamma s. And in the last part of the talk, since this is holotube, I would like to argue that this is also going to be the case in ADS-CFT. So uh, once we are at this point, I would like to ask you again if you have any question. Uh, mm -hmm. OK. Uh, no question. What? OK, so as I said, in the final part of the talk, I will be discussing singulants in ADS-CFT. So the first ingredient to discuss singulants in ADS-CFT, well, I'm going to be discussing singulants in ADS-CFT for longitudinal flows. So the first ingredient that we need is finding out what the bulk, the bulk dual to a longitudinal flow is. And once we know this, we can employ fluid gravity duality to find the gradient expansion of pi star from the gradient expansion of the bulk metric. OK, so to construct the back dual to longitudinal flow, we are going to employ these metric ansatz here, put forward previously by the TFR group. And to perform explicit computations, we are going to work in a flow-adapted boundary coordinate system. OK, so this flow-adapted boundary coordinate system has a, long, has a time coordinate tau and a space-like space coordinate sigma, which parameterize the longitudinal plane, and then it has the standard transverse directions. Okay, So the fluid velocity is simply given by partial tau. It's proportional to partial tau. And the transverse field, orthogonal to the fluid velocity, is given by partial sigma. Now, the boundary conditions we are going to impose on this problem are standard. So in the infrared, we are going to demand that our problem obeys uh, in falling boundary conditions. And in the UV, we are going to demand that the boundary metric is given by this uh, Minkowski space metric written in flow-adapted coordinates and that we are in the Landau frame. And under these uh, assumptions, under this parameterization, uh, holographic randomization tells you right away that the dissipative tensor, pi star, is given by a, in a particular radial gauge, is given by a particular component of the near boundary expansion of one of the functions we are using to parameterize our metric tensor, this bit that you can see here, and which measures the anisotropy between uh, longitudinal and transverse spatial directions. OK, now, to construct the gradient expansion of the metric, we are going to follow the standard procedure in fluid gravity duality. We are going to divide the Einstein equations into dynamical equations and constraint equations. Now, the dynamical equations can be thought of as the ADS safety analog of the equation of motion for pi mu nu in MIS-like models, while the constraint equation are, equations are going to impose the conservation of the dual energy momentum tensor. 
As a standard, we are going to introduce our auxiliary bookkeeping parameter epsilon, which counts the number of space-time gradients in a given expansion through the following homogeneous rescaling of the boundary coordinates, leaving the radial coordinate untouched. And finally, we are going to put forward a formal power series uh, expansion for the functions parameterizing our metric tensor. We are going to introduce this into the dynamical equation, Einstein's equations rescaled by epsilon, and then we are going to expand and solve order by order. So the combined result of one, two, and three are going to be the recursion relations for the gradient expansion of the metric. Now, we are going to solve these recursion relations in the way that I explained by putting forward this factorial over power ansatz. And the only assumption we are going to make here is that we are going to have the same singular field for each component of the metric tensor. The main consequence of these ansatz is that the singular field is going to be independent of the radial direction. And if you follow this procedure to the end, what you find is a generalized agent value problem that would tell you what the longitudinal derivative of the singular is. So here you have the problem. Its particular form is not important, only its properties are. And I want to emphasize that these properties are completely analogous to the ones shown by the singular equation of motion in MIS-like models. So first, this generalized agent value problem is ultra-local in the boundary directions. So if you're at a given space-time point, the problem only depends on your energy density and fluid velocity at you know, the associated boundary coordinates and not on their boundary space and derivatives. And also provided that you know the energy density, fluid velocity, and transverse derivative of the single field at a point, you can solve this generalized value problem to find what the longitudinal derivative of the single field is and time golf. So this is a problem which provided initial data and a background, a, black, a background fluid flow would fix for you completely the singular dynamics. And now, given my previous observation about the relationship between singular dynamics and force of the mass, it's natural to wonder whether this agent value problem is related to the computation of the force of gamma s. And to address this question, of course, we have to know how to compute gamma s in ADCFT. Fortunately for us, gamma s can be straightforwardly computed in the all orders linearized hydrodynamics formalism put forward by Bu and Lublinsky in 2014. So these authors actually uh, wrote down the most generic constitutive relations in the microscopic theory for shear and sound channel perturbations of thermal equilibrium. You can find them here, so written in Fourier space. So what you have here is the perturbation of the dissipative tensor expressed as a linear combination of the Fourier transform of the shear tensor and the Fourier transform of this other object built out of the divergence of the um, velocity perturbation with weights which correspond to, to momentum dependent transport coefficients. So this is a momentum dependent shear viscosity, for instance. Now, this momentum dependent transport coefficients can be computed right away by solving a system of four coupled radial ordinary differential equations in a black background. And it turns out that at a given frequency and momenta, Gamma S in ADCFT, which we defined using the definition I showed you before, is nothing but a linear combination of these two objects here, previously defined by Bu and Lublinsky, implying that the Bu and Lublinsky construction can be adapted right away for our purposes. Okay? So I'm going to show you here the general structure of Gamma S as a complex function. So the important point to keep in mind is that for a fixed momentum, Gamma S is going to be a meromorphic function of the frequency. And if the momentum is real, it's going to feature the standard Christmas tree of simple poles you may be familiar with from, from computations of retarded two-point correlators and quasi-normal modes. So here you have an example in which we set the momentum to zero and we compute uh, the magnitude of Gamma S as a function of complex frequency. And you see here that you have two lines of poles symmetric with respect to the imaginary axis. Now, it turns out that at zero momentum, these poles agree with the non-hydrodynamic modes, the non-hydrodynamic quasi normal modes in the sound channel. But this relationship, this specific numeric uh, quantitative relationship, is lost if you make the momentum finite. So what happens as you make the momentum finite is just extremely, uh, you know, it parallels closely, closely what happens to non-hydrodynamic uh, quasi-normal modes. So the real part of the poles of the mass is going to increase, and then uh, their imaginary part is going to decrease uh, in such a way that they describe these trajectories you can see here. Now, we have also shown that the poles of gamma s we are interested in can be computed in terms of a new uh, generalizing the value problem, which takes this form. And it turns out that in the ADS-CFT context, there is a generalization of the map 
I showed you before for MIS like models, which would send this uh, edge value problem computing the post to MIS to an edge value to the edge value problem that computes the single integration of motion for you. Okay. So what this shows is that again in ADS-CFT, we seem to have a relationship between singular dynamics and pulse of gamma s. So the singular dynamics are again determined by a particular linear responsibility problem formulated around uh, thermal equilibrium. And moreover, given that this map exists and that it seems that the factorial of a power ansatz solves the recursion relations at asymptotically large order in ADS-CFT, you know, the factorial growth for the gradient expansion in generic longitudinal flows is at the very least self-consistent in holography. Now, uh, we didn't perform the explicit numerical computation of the gradient expansion for longitudinal flows in ADCFT. If you want to try, you're more than welcome. But the natural expectation based on our previous work in mirrorless rails toward like models is that the factorial growth would naturally show up. Okay, so with this, I conclude the second part of the talk and I want to leave you with some take home points. And the first and most important one is that the asymptotic behavior of the gradient expansion is going to simplify dramatically at large orders and is going to be governed by singulars. As I've shown you along the talk, singulars are a useful notion in MIS-like theories and in holography. And I would tell you to see the paper if you want to learn more about singulars in genetic theory. Third most important point is that singulars generalize non-heterodynamic quasi-normal modes to far from equilibrium situations. And in particular, they obey simple equations of motion, which are dictated by a linear response theory problem that I have defined. And finally, as the BRS3 example that I mentioned shows, singulars are intimately connected to the emergence of an optimal truncation order of the gradient expansion. Okay, and with this I conclude. I hope I have concluded. Yeah, I have concluded in time. So I would say that our work leaves open many questions and suggests plenty of avenues for future exploration that I want to discuss now, if I may. Can I, can I go on or do you want me to leave room for questions? No, of course, uh, please, please go ahead. Okay. So as I said, uh, this work uh, opens many avenues for future exploration, uh, which are going to demand again, uh, new explicit computations and novel analytic insights. So you would notice that a question that I didn't touch upon was how to set the initial conditions for the singular fields in order to solve the singular equation of motion. Now we've only managed to make progress uh, on this front by working in the linear response regime. I have some examples in the backup slides if you want to look at them, but the systematic relationship between initial data for singulars and initial data for the fluid flow remains still unknown to us. And it's also, it's also interesting to wonder whether if this relationship were known to us, we would be able to employ it to place constraints on the magnitude of the singular fields across the space time, and hence to estimate where relativistic hydrodynamics truncated to low orders is not going to be applicable because you don't have an optimal truncation order, for instance. Uh, I've also focused in Longitudinal flows. I have not, not discussed singulars beyond longitudinal flows. You can look at uh, appendix B in our singular paper if you want to have a guess of what the large order behavior for a generic fluid flow might look like when expressed in terms of singulars. But as of now, we don't have a completely general answer. We can we can test. Uh, I've also discussed singulars in a very specific formulation of the gradient expansion, which made a particular choice of collective fields and a particular usage of the redundancies implied by the conservation equation of the energy momentum tensor. So it's natural to wonder what is the, what are the singular dynamics in other formulations of the hydrodynamic gradient expansion, and also whether there is a map between the singulars in different formulations. Finally, I want to mention that as we learn in the course of our work, uh, singulars seem to be a useful notion also in the context of non-relativistic hydrodynamics. So there are specific models in which the story is quite similar to the BRS3 story that I showed you in the talk. And finally, since singulars seem to be an extremely useful notion to handle the large flow behavior of perturbative expansions, I also want to leave you with the question of whether you can make use of singulars in other perturbative expansions useful in ADCFT, for instance, the large D expansion. So with this, I would conclude and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much for this very nice talk, inspiring. And um, can you, uh, yeah, please, um, can everybody ask questions? <laughs>
Okay. Martin has a question. question by Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for your nice talk. Hi. Um, I've got a question concerning this gamma s from from holography. Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. You said like when you computed uh, like the pole-like structure, then of course only for k being zero, it agrees with like the tree-like structure, which yeah. we are supposed yes. to get from holography. But I think this is um, more or less because gamma s in that case reduces just to to, to eta of omega and k. No, so no, yeah. Yes, that's yes. not surprising. But no. can you give me a kind of an intuitive argument, like why I should be interested in gamma s at all? Sorry well, for this provocative uh, question. You mean independently of the single and dynamics? Yes. Okay. So um, if you follow Wall Lublinsky and you want to, so the point of gamma s is, I would say, is this definition that I gave you here, right? So I guess that using this definition in the ADSCP context, you can probably think of gamma s as the retarded two-point function between this uh, fluctuation of the dissipative tensor and this fluctuation of the fluid velocity. So if you give me a fluctuation of the fluid velocity and you want to know what its effect in the dissipative tensor is, what you should do is to inverse the Fourier transform this quantity. And to do that, you need to know the pole structure of gamma s. So that's a reason for being interested in gamma s. I mean, I would say that you have the same reason for being interested in gamma s as the reason you wouldn't have for being interested in this momentum dependent transport coefficients introduced by von Lublinsky because they're essentially linear. Gamma s is a linear combination of these guys. So this is basically that if you give me mm, velocity perturbations and you want to know what the dissipative part of the stress energy tensor is, you have to Fourier transform this object and as in any inverse Fourier transform this object and as in any inverse Fourier transform, you need to know what the singularity structure of these guys are. And so my second question is about, um, so you said, of course, we can use this Boo and Lublinsky form uh, for mm -hmm. all order linearized hydro. Yes. But can we go beyond that and compute uh, gamma s? Um, I don't think I understand the question. So what do you have in mind precisely? So of course, um, you, you make there certain assumption is all ordered linearized hydrodynamics. So, so basically beyond linearized hydrodynamics. So can we uh, compute there also this gamma s? Mm, uh, so you mean a similar notion beyond linearized hydrodynamics? Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I, I guess there should be one, right? Because you can always from you can always formulate a perturbative expansion in amplitude, and I guess you would have related objects. But I, I guess they would. Okay, my, my only guess is that you would have a generalization which would also involve higher m point functions. But other than that, I'm I'm not sure really. I'm not sure. So this, this analysis is um, restricted to linear response regime. And the nice part of the analysis of our analysis here is that it will tell you what the single and dynamics are. That, that's it. OK, thanks. OK, you're welcome. I had a question related to gamma s. So I will mm -hmm. jump in while others uh, still think, maybe. Please go ahead. Um, so in, in the last part of your talk, you, you showed how, yeah, basically, this is good. Um, gamma S is, is related to eta in, and K squared sky. Yeah, yeah, sky. Um, and you also pointed out that gamma S is, is uh, uh, its poles are, are relevant for the, um, uh, for the dynamics, for the equation of motions of the single lens. Yes. I'm I'm trying to understand this connection. Somehow, this uh, this the single lens seemed to have a slight obsession with the sound uh, channel. No, no. But keep in mind that whatever all I said in this talk pertains longitudinal flows. So longitudinal flows, when linearized, oh. are sound waves. I see. That's why. Okay, good. I, I was yeah, about yeah, to yeah, ask exactly for that question. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I wanted to understand. Thank you. Yeah, that's why. So, uh, as I said in the conclusions, we don't really know yet what the full picture, uh, you know, when mm -hmm. it comes to singulars and our sort of behavior is for generic fluid flows. We but you also had um, you had transverse gradients in in one of your uh, in your ansatz, right? Not only longitudinal gradients that didn't. Uh, Sorry, then I probably that's not probably in um, the, the background flow. That's probably a perturbation. So, uh, you mean here in this singular equation of motion, for instance? 
Uh, I think that's what it was. So you, when you, yes, well, well when you extended the, the um, Yannick, Hella and friends um, model, I believe yeah, you yeah, did. It's, it's, it's here. Yeah, it's this model here. Is this so, the manifestation of that model? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so the, the transverse uh, gradients did not do the trick to um, excite any other modes besides the sound mode that would would play a role in the uh, relaxation. No, not in this case because of our symmetry restrictions. So, so if I if I looked at a, a holographic setting uh, like like Larry Yaffe and Paul Chesler did, where you have an isotropization after an initial shear, um, they there you would expect some other modes to be excited and yeah, and I, some I, other mode to govern the 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 single lens dynamics, not yeah. sound modes. Yeah, yeah. In that case, I guess it would be exciting the tensor modes, right? Yeah. But it's okay, difficult good. To me, it's difficult to me. It's difficult to me to think about um, how they interplay with the brain expansion because you know they're non hydrodynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. But okay, yeah, I guess, you, I guess you can you can take this and to construct and construct a toy model of uh, holographic isotropization if you wish. Uh, I don't see an abstraction in doing that. Uh, at least not any obvious uh, abstraction in doing that. And by the way, I want to point out this is not the most generic model of this kind because there is an extra. Independent operator we can add here that we have not included uh, for you know simplicity. But in principle, it's possible for you to you know write down the most generic uh, MIS-like model featuring these terms up to second order, and it's you know it's, it's it's this plus an extra term. So you can probably take that and do a study of linear isotropization, uh, isotropization and so on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Are there any more questions? If there are, oh, there. Okay. Move again. Please. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, concerning your first part, your introductory introduction part of uh, your talk. Yes. Uh, you have this kind of inverted uh, Pusse expansion in, in the vicinity of branch points. A little bit. Uh, uh, so you're talking uh, about yeah, this? Uh, just a moment. Uh, one step, uh, one slide uh, forward. Here? Here. Well, you have this uh, series expansion tau to, to the power of four over three. I don't think I understand the question. Sorry. Uh, can you can you repeat the question? Uh, so, sorry again. But here you have a, a typical branch band in, in the Riemann surface is clear, yes. and then you have this uh, expansions in 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 tau. Yeah, the expansion in, in tau is in the, for... in the parameter tower. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah this yeah, is the you have this example here. And uh, in this last equation, where's this um, this fractional power emerging from? What ah. is defining it? You should have a kind of polynomial that you are expanding uh, around the branch point. And I'm just wondering for this typical model, you should uh, have a very special polynomial. I'm, I'm wondering when you have other branch points. Higher order branch band, so this uh, exponential, this fractional power will change. Obviously, do we have examples for this in your consideration as well? Or um, okay, so what I can tell you, and this is that this power is fixed by ideal hydrodynamics, uh, given the symmetry assumptions of Björgen flow. Aha, so it's 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 directly following from the structure of this dynamical equation of this yeah, hydrodynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you have, yeah, I see. yeah, yeah. So 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 if you if you use uh, the hydrodynamic gradient expansion. Yes. Uh, to compute you know, the large tau expansion of this quantity and uh, with these symmetry restrictions, it would naturally lead to the factorial powers. So the information that is not universal here are these uh, coefficients which are related. To yeah, the sure, 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 sure. That, that, that's clear, yes. oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, but it, follow, it follows from uh, ideal flow is this, and then you have corrections. I see. So it will, uh, when you are generalizing your model to a higher dimension or so, this power will obviously change then. Yeah, yeah. So, so when we when we break the when when we break boost invariance in the longitudinal plane and we consider um, generic longitudinal fluid flows, there is also a change in perspective because we are not going to be working directly with an expansion in inverse powers of the proper time, right? Now, it's yeah. not a useful notion because the dynamics depend on an additional coordinate. So, what we do is to change perspective, and what we do is um, mm -mm, I have here this. So now we think. No, no, that that's absolutely clear. That's clear. 
Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. It's, it's, ah, yeah. Okay. So it's what just it it had been just proper time. Nothing else is. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. good. Okay. So. Okay. Please. Thank you very much. No, you're welcome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the questions and thanks for the answer, Alexandre. Are there um, any more questions? If there are no official questions, then we can stop the recording at this point, um, but not before thanking Alexandre again. Thank you so much for this very nice, inspiring and clear, clear talk. Thank you everyone for the lively discussion and um, see you again next time. Stay on if you would like to have an informal chat.